Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 174. To back or not to back? How to decide if a Kickstarter or other crowdfunding project is worth backing. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So tonight, we've got someone wanting to know what we look for when deciding to back a game on Kickstarter. After that, we've got a preview of a game coming soon to Kickstarter, so I thought that integrated well. Uh, this is Hellbringer, a Diablo-inspired roguelike card game. And then we wrap up with a pretty short week in review, as none of us got a lot of gaming in this past week, but there was some, including an epic finale to a long-running game campaign. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Let's start with some comments on our most recent article about unappealing games that ended up being way better than they look. Now, Martin Voss writes, What does Terraforming Mars do in this list? Mm. That game is gorgeous. The look of the game appealed as much to me as the topic. I agree, Dominion doesn't look as great as it should, though. All right, Martin, honestly, uh, I... I don't know how to explain this, but you are honestly the first person I have ever seen call Terraforming Mars gorgeous. Uh, seriously, I love the game, but it's anything but gorgeous. Okay, maybe the board part, just the board is effective, but that's about it. Super thin player boards, chipping metal painted cubes, stock art on the cards mixed with graphics that aren't even the same type. And even the tiles have these like abstract symbols that don't tell you at all what they're supposed to represent. Like you, they could have been better. There's nothing that tells you what they are. Like, I, I'm sorry, Martin. I, I do appreciate you interact with our show quite often, but I can't back you up on this one. Oh, I'm glad you agree on Dominion. Well, I have to agree with Mo on this one. It's a great game. We all adore it. But you could have told me it was from some no-name publisher or local prototype, and I probably would have believed you. Mm. This stock art is a very obvious thing in particular. All right, well, sticking with the same topic, MX Fraud writes, I'll have to disagree on Terraforming Mars. I find it both ugly and horrible to play. <laughs> it has a large fan base, so I'm probably the outlier in that opinion. Draconis Invasion is really intriguing. I will check it out. Thanks for sharing. So for a second there, I thought we had another Martin just to disprove what I'd said about him being the only one that ever said it was it, it, it was beautiful. But no, uh, this is more the fact they don't actually like it. Uh, this I can get behind. You know what? Not everyone is going to enjoy Terraforming Mars. Uh, it's long. It's got a high learning curve for learning to play well. Like it's not hard to learn to play, but to be able to play well and compete well in that game. And it's quite fiddly with all the cubes you got to track and tokens and icons and everything. And it, it tends to overstay its welcome for some players, often fixed with the expansions. It's definitely not for every group, so totally agree. And I'm also happy to hear someone turned on to Draconis from us, and that's awesome. Um, I almost wish we'd gotten in at least one round of Draconis when you were down for the May 2-4, because I really do enjoy the game. Well, thanks for the comment, Mix Froud. Well, next I've got a comment from Ingolf Schaefer about our The One Ring starter set review. They write, we played the whole mini campaign in our group, nice. and I confess that I really loved it. It is the most unepic hero's journey, but so much fun. Thanks, Ingolf. Uh, that, that's a good way to put it, actually. I like it. I do like it. Um, we mentioned during the review that um, this is a Hobbit scaled adventure for Hobbits in the Shire. It's quite different from your usual RPG starter set um, introduction. And I got to say, this sounds fantastic. I'm really looking forward to running it. It's still on the schedule for us, but we got a few more weeks before we actually get started on playing. Well, finally, a deep cut of our review of the 8-bit box from Yellow got a comment this past week from Scott Eden, who says, Thanks for the review. I opened it up last night, and the games didn't really look very good. Your review has convinced me to give them a try. Nice. And I love the controllers. They are awesome, aren't they? Um, I am always happy when our older content gets some uh, attention. Um, like I wish this game did, actually, because the entire concept of the 8-bit box seemed so cool to me. And the included games really weren't bad. Like, I, some were a little simple, but like the, the whole sports one was actually really well done and did give that old school track and field feel to it. And you know what? The Pac-Man game won over everyone I taught it to. 
I don't think you're going to want to play it a hundred times, but it was still fun to play. I, there was a ton of potential in that box that just sadly never came to fruit. Now, Yellow did release one more game to the system. It was a double dragon clone. But as far as I know, it's now dead because nothing else has come out since. And that was 2019, I think, that came out. So I don't think there's new stuff coming. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We've got a big announcement for you tonight. Our next giveaway launches right now live on the blog but check it out once you're done here for those of you here live i don't think any there's no early bird votes or, or or points or bonus entries this time so this time we're giving away a sealed copy oh here's something i did not think to put in the background oh if i can see it i'll hold it up but i don't get right now room but i don't know where all right i tried uh, this time, we're giving away a sealed copy of one of the best games we discovered in 2021 last year. It's a game that our entire family loved, especially my kids. It was honestly one of the best gaming experiences we've had as a family. And that game is Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, the first Coded Chronicles game from the op and our friends Sen Fum Lim and Jay Cormier. One of the best escape room in a box style games we've ever played. Head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and check out the pinned post. While you are there, check out our Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion review to see why you should be excited about this game. And note, I said we played it with the kids, but it is not necessarily a kid's game. Adults are going to enjoy this one. Everyone knows Scooby-Doo at this point. As long as you know the Scooby characters, there's a lot of fun to be had. Now, we have one sealed copy of this game, and we're willing to ship it anywhere in the continental U.S. or Canada. Uh, getting to something we were talking about in the pre-show, I'm sorry, we cannot do any other international shipping. Just can't afford it. Now, this giveaway will run for three weeks, at the end of which we will draw one winner who we will contact by email. As expected, entries to this contest are free, and you will get bonus entries for doing things like following us on social media, sharing the giveaway, etc. Also, remember, Patreon patrons at the hotel guest level or more always get five bonus entries to any of our giveaways as one of their backer rewards. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night question. Tonight's question comes from Nathan Beard, who writes, Hi, Mo. Love, love, love your site, style of writing, and expertise. Well, I'd love to see an article providing a guide or methodology for picking new Kickstarter games to back. Well, thanks so much for the question, Nathan. Uh, first off, I want to note that Nathan was also looking for a like a top list of the best games to come from Kickstarter, which I think is a really solid topic and something we may want to talk about at some point, but it's a big enough topic to me to talk about on its own. So I've decided to save that question to potentially answer later. So if you're looking for that, maybe we'll have a link to that when it comes out later and we'll go back and edit this so we'll point to it or something. Now, I also know that Nathan is looking for a blog article, right? Something to read. And I thought the first step, though, before writing an article, and this is how I do all my articles, would be for Sean and I to sit down and discuss the topic first. For one, then you get both our opinions. Plus, we'll see if we're on the same page, as well as brainstorm ideas and tips, where if I read it on my own, you're just going to get my side of things. And I'm sure Sean will bring up something I didn't think of, and he'll probably bring up something that... Um, will make me think of things in a totally different way. So here we are talking about it live here on Twitch. Now, the reason I chose this topic to talk about is because of our last Sunday brunch episode. Yeah, for those of you who may not know, most Sundays, Mo and I, and sometimes Deanna, go live at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and host an mm -hmm. unscripted show where we talk about all things geeky and gaming. Now, a part of that show usually ends up being talking about new game releases, but mm -hmm. also new crowdfunding projects and projects that are ending soon. Now, last week, we looked at a significantly large number of projects because we'd taken a few Sundays off and they kind of built up. So we looked at everything that basically launched in, um, not everything, sorry, anything that caught our eye that launched in May, as well as anything that was ending that weekend. And I don't know if it's true, but it sure felt like we looked at a lot of questionable projects projects that seem to have issues with them that made us kind of back off and think i don't know like these weren't necessarily bad projects but projects that left us with questions and that we had various concerns about 
In fact, the more we do this, the more certain things start to mm -hmm. stick out as concerning trends that are to be watched out for when looking at projects. Now, in particular, I remember uh, saying the word red flags a lot and talking about red flags a lot during that show. And when I saw this question, um, again, going through, I've got an Excel file where I log everyone's questions they send, and I'm going through, you know, what should we talk about next? And I'm like, well, last week we did a, I, I'm going to say top 10. We don't do top 10, but we did a game recommendation list. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't like doing two game recommendation lists in a row, so I wanted something we can chit-chat about. So I saw this chit-chat episode, and I'm like, wait, that's perfect. Like, just this last weekend, we were talking about the various red flags. And I will say one thing right now. Please don't be worried. We are not going to call out any specific projects tonight. We are talking in general. So I don't want to scare anyone away. If you're a, you're a Kickstarter project you have out there, we're not specifically talking about you. So what we do on Sundays is we put together a list of projects that fit certain criteria, but that often doesn't involve actually looking at the project. This gives us a chance to look at them fresh without mm -hmm. preconceptions live on the show. Yeah, that's part of that show. Whereas if generally, if we talk about a Kickstarter here on our podcast, we already know about it. We want to highlight it because we're already interested or there's some other reason we want to highlight it. Whereas those, we tend to go in pretty much blind except for the fact that there's buzz. And a lot of what I know about these projects is if other people are talking about them, then I'll at least have an idea of what people are excited about. Now, also, I don't wanna be overly negative tonight. This is not a bash on Kickstarter projects night or crowdfunding. I keep saying crowdfunding. So that's the other thing. This is not just Kickstarter, this is crowdfunding. So every time I say Kickstarter, just change it in your head to crowdfunding. Uh, just like, you know, Kleenex and Reese's, I don't say peanut butter cups because Kickstarter kind of did it first, so it sticks in my head as the brand. So I don't want to talk about just the negative, what scares us away. I also want to talk about what makes us want to back a project, and if there's anything that's basically an auto back for either of us. But let's start off with the negative and the warning signs. And as, we, as Mo was just saying, uh, Nathan specifically mentions Kickstarter in their question, but none of what we're going to talk about is Kickstarter specific. All of this should apply equally to any crowdfunding platform, though I will point out that, for instance, some other sites display things very differently mm -hmm. than Kickstarter, which makes it harder or at least different to spot some of these red flags that we're going to be talking about. So let's start with those red flags. So again, red flag doesn't necessarily mean we're looking at a bad game or a bad project. These are just things that make us dive deeper. Something that's going to make me do research before picking a backer level. That said, they're kind of like strikes in baseball to me. If a single project has enough red flags, that's usually reason enough for at least me not to back. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and one of the first things that you see when you're backing a game or one of the first things that you look at when you're backing a game is who's involved, who is, who has created the project mm -hmm. that's right there uh, up front. So and, what about them? Yeah. So the things I look for, for, for who, who created the project, right? So what's listed there is, is, is the person who the company is, or sometimes an individual person. And with that is a couple pieces of data with that. So I'm going to jump around a bit in our notes here and start by saying, if I've never heard of the person, to me, that's a red flag right away. Now that's very harsh. Right. Like I'm, I'm, there's going to be lots of people I've never heard of, but with how involved I am in the board game industry, seeing a completely new name is a bit of a rarity when we're talking about hobby board games. I'm looking for established companies, established publishers, established designers, established printing companies. I'm just looking for something familiar. And if I don't see any of that, it's a key to dig deeper. It's a, that, but then I'll do my research. It's the I don't know who this is now, instead of looking and going, Oh, well, it's Isaac Childress. I'm right now. Okay. I, I, they've delivered multiple projects. I got nothing to really worry about as far as who's running things. There might be other issues, but I can, I can just go on. But then if I look it up and I see um, Max Gauthier and I'm like, who the heck's Max Gauthier? I'll go on board game geek and be like, okay, is, uh, do they have a designer entry? Oh, they do. And they have a website and I'll do some diving. I'll be like, Oh, they have some chops. They've designed other games. They've done other work and so on. So the first thing is that familiarity. Do I know the people involved? And right after that, because the first thing you see under their name is how they've been involved with projects. Yes. Uh, you know, have they have they made their own projects before? Have they have they been around on the site? Have they backed other projects? 
And if they have never done anything before, and almost especially if they've never backed anything before, mm -hmm. that's concerning. Because if you haven't been involved in the process on either side of the aisle, you there that there there are problems. I mean, pick funding, crowdfunding, something is difficult. It mm -hmm. is not an easy process. So if you're starting completely from scratch, how how did you get involved in this? How much do you know? And how much are you prepared for some of the, the hiccups that could come your way yeah. as crowdfunding proceeds? So yeah, there's a we often and on our Sunday shows or when we're looking at Kickstarter, again, crowdfunding, if we're looking at them, we'll often say, oh, zero created, zero back. And, and like those two together are a red flag. Yeah. One of those is is like a, a pink flag. It's like, a, you know, might want to look a little more into it. But zero created, zero back scares me. So, so one of the things, I'm going to start with zero back. For me, like Sean said, it's familiarity, but it also shows that the person's part of the greater board game. I hate using the term industry, but it's what everyone uses. The the, the the board hobby board game industry. I can't think of or a better community. word off the top. Community, there you go. Hobby board game community, right? If you are backing, you're supporting other people. I want to see someone willing to support someone else who's like, if you're looking for support, I want to see that you've supported others in the industry. I want to see what you and then I want to see who you supported. So I want to see what you've backed. So if you're I don't know, doing a deck building game. And I look and it looks like you backed all these Kickstarter deck builders and you're really involved in DC. I get a better idea of who you are and why you may be qualified to make this game you're trying to sell to me. And just knowing Kickstarter, using Kickstarter, using the platform, knowing things about the platform, all of that stuff, to me, scares me if you don't have any of them. Yeah. Now, again, I get it if you haven't backed anything, but I would go so far, and we are going to have some tips thrown in here, is that if you are thinking of launching a Kickstarter, back something, like something, find, there's got to be something. If you're a gamer, you're going to find something on Kickstarter. Even if all you do is back 10, the top 10 projects on Kickstarter right now at a buck, to look at what they're doing so you can see what you should be doing. Yeah. Even that would qualify. Now, again, we are talking about red flags here, not dead things. So it, it is completely possible that you could have decided to create a business account and not use your personal account to start mm -hmm. your Kickstarter. So it is quite possible that it could be zero created, zero backed, even though the person behind that account sure. has backed hundreds of things. And that's one of those reasons why it's a flag and means you need to look deeper. You need to see Correct. who these people are. Maybe there's a perfectly acceptable reason why they've got a couple of zeros up there. And again, as a tip for someone who has a project, if you did just launch your company to launch a Kickstarter, say that and give us that background so I don't have to dig too. Yeah, give me a link to, you know, who you are so I can yeah. say, oh, well, of course. Perfect. That's just a new company. Yep. Great. All right. Zero created. First project. I know you got to start somewhere. I get it. Every person has a zero created project at least once. Right. It's got to happen. I fully understand that. But it is a flag if it's a big massive epic thing if your first created is a prototype copy on a deck of cards that you used magic card creator to create and you really want this thing to exist and you can tell you're excited about it and you say zero created good on you because that's what kickstarter was created for yep and i will be possibly back that if the game looks interesting or if i know you and i just want to support you which we'll get to some of the green flags later now, here's my tip, though. If you have something epic, find a way to kickstart a small part of it. Now, it's kind of hard to describe, but if you were going to put out, I'm trying to think of a good epic, the Twilight Imperium, try to put out maybe a Twilight Imperium art book or a, the, the, the history of Twilight Imperium, or here's some sci-fi ships. I've seen this a couple of times. I've seen metal coins or miniatures for a game that doesn't exist yet, but people will still be interested in it. That way you get that one created under your belt and you prove that you can use the platform, you can deliver, you can interact with people. And again, we're not gonna talk about all the things you should do to run a Kickstarter, but you can basically prove your worth on something smaller. And we see so many massive projects with tons of miniatures, with overproduced 10,000 cards, 3,000 hours of gameplay, zero created, zero backed. And I'm like, right away, I'm 
Like, I, I, how do I know you're going to manage all of this? I'm much more likely to manage the person who's come up with board game tape. And it's something that you can use to tape your games together. That's not going to leave sticky stuff behind. Yeah. It, there's a, and there's a, there's another sort of a, a key joint. So if you've got zero backed, the, the amount of money you're asking for becomes something to immediately look at. So if you, mm -hmm. if you've never backed anything and you're asking for a couple of thousand dollars, okay, that's a re that's reasonable. That's a, this is a small project and maybe mm -hmm. you're going to make it big, but if you're starting your first ever project and you don't appear to have any other projects behind you in other ways, and you're asking for $350,000, that's a huge red flag for me. Yeah. This is, that's terrifying for me because that is a lot of money to have responsibility for. <laughs> and then again, red flag, this is gonna make me dig. If I see that, I better be able to scroll down your project and see some form of pie chart or something that is showing me why you need all that money and what it's for and who's getting what. Show me that you've actually done a budget, not just went three hundred thousand dollars. I could use that. Yep. Or, or, or you know, you got your, you got the, you got one quote for how much your board game is going to cost to produce, and you said, oh well, I'm going to sell ten thousand of those, ten thousand times that number. Boom, there you go. That's my. Yep. That's how much money I need. I've seen it. Oh yeah, no, it's. I have definitely seen it. <laughs> There's a now, reason why this up, is a red flag. <laughs> yes. Now, since you brought it up, I also have concerns with the exact opposite. People who put a funding goal that's so easy to hit, it's like I, I, they did it just so it can fund and they can make the thing and they get some money is what it feels like. If you put it too low, it feels like, like here I am just going to do it. And now sometimes I see this when the game's already produced, which is another red flag, which we'll talk about in a second. I don't know about a red flag, but it's something worth discussing. Um, but seeing a backer level that's ridiculously low. And where we're seeing this a lot recently is a relaunch. So someone will launch a Kickstarter and want $100,000, and they don't even get close. And then they relaunch with an $800 goal. And I'm like, whoa, wait, what happened to the 100000 you needed a month ago? How is it 800 now? Yeah, and unfortunately, I think one of the major driving factors behind these lower levels is backer kit or its various I, I i don't want to call it backer kit specifically but any of the backer systems mm -hmm. uh that are that are essentially pre-order systems so a lot of projects are almost encouraging people to go in as low as possible in order to yep. make up all that money on the back end with add-ons and customizing customizing your orders uh and that's problematic in a number of ways um, but it also makes it more difficult to see that low number as a red flag. You need to, again, something to look at, you know, are they pushing towards a backer kit where that money is going to come in? Yeah, they're, they're just using Kickstarter for the hype at that point, which acceptable uses of Kickstarter is probably a whole other topic, <laughs> but I will admit for us, they can be red flags. Like one of the questions I will ask myself is, should this be on Kickstarter? Why is this person using Kickstarter? And I will fully admit that they are trying to get in the buzz and they're trying to use it as a uh, pre-order system is a legit use for Kickstarter now, it, yeah. what most people do. But there are a lot of stuff that's like crafty, homemade stuff that I honestly think better fits on Etsy. And I totally do not understand why people are even allowed to sell STL files on Kickstarter. I don't get it. Because like the work's done, you have a finished project, you're just selling files. Again, that really belongs on drive through RPG or Thingverse or something like that, and not Kickstarter. Now, if you're going to tell me I'm going to hire a 3D artist to make these, but then that would never get funded. So, because you need your mock-ups to even be able to get it. So, and, and I will admit, I personally have had bad experience with miniature heavy Kickstarters. Yeah, it's, I, and this is one of those things where, again, you know, it's a different topic, but uh, I have personally complained to Kickstarter because there have been projects which say we have it it's in our warehouse, yeah, buy which it, is buy it on Kickstarter and Kickstarter has allowed them to continue. So the, the yeah. platform is evolving. Um, and, uh, you know, again, those are red flags, though. If, if I see yeah. something that at one point broke the rules even if the rules have evolved if it was well, it's still the, the rules, rules as written right now yeah, yeah. that's okay. there is that but if i see something that it that is 
pushing against the rules of 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 the crowdfunding pro, uh, platform you really kind of have asked ask why maybe it's cool maybe they are testing the waters and and you know there's a paradigm shift and they're doing something new and that's great or maybe they're just using the platform because it gets a lot of people yep all right what did i want to we 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 kind of went out of order from our notes and i'm like not even sure what to talk about next all right you know what let's since we're talking about money let's move on to backer levels one of the things uh, Sean does this quicker than I do. I, I tend to scroll through the platform where Sean does jump to the backer levels right away when we're reviewing these. And I don't know if that's just a division of work that kind of <laughs> happened over time or not, but backer levels can be huge. Like they have to make sense. Absolutely. And not only that, I will look at how many people are in on a backer level. So if you've got something that already has red flags and there are some, you know, strange backer levels that are really, really high levels. So if you've got like something that is be that a backer level that is a percentage, a notable percentage of your total, and that's funded by multiple people for something that already has a bunch of red flags, um, you could very well be, you know, scamming the system. I mean, I'm not going to go so far as saying, you know, money laundering or anything like that. But if you're bringing your friends in yeah, to... To, I, to I, tend to, sure I tend to see those funding. as friends and family pledges. You are you are getting people who are investing right. in your project instead of right. So you're bringing in these investors at the very high levels, which pushes you over your funding level, without actually show enough any number of people showing that they really support you. Um, mm -hmm. And and so that's a huge thing. And then your next problem, and this is something we see with really established projects. I mean, something that, that doesn't have a lot of red flags otherwise will have this vastly confusing number of backer levels. Um, uh, the perfect example, no, you know what, we're not going to no, call, call any, no, we're not calling call any specific, but there's, there's wanna... one, there's, there are some where it's, you need to spend ages trying to figure out how to get what you want. Yes. And I have come into a couple of occasions uh, on projects that I wanted to back where I stopped because I could not buy the products or, you know, pick just In the, the combo products you wanted. I wanted. The, the, the combo I wanted did not exist. Yeah. Um, and I ended up waiting and I didn't go in and I, you know, eventually there was a, a, a backer kit level I could, I could go in and pre-order, but that was, you know, that wasn't clear at the time. So I didn't just back at the $1 level and I just went in later when they opened up pre-orders afterwards. So if you, you can certainly be hurting yourself if you aren't offering the product to people that they want. Now, my biggest scare with backer levels that will be such a big red flag, I just won't back you, is if your math doesn't make sense. Where you offer whatever at this level, or you can get six copies at this level, or you can do this other thing with this t-shirt and these two free add-ons, or you can get just the add-ons, and it actually works out that the game's cheapest if I just buy the individual, and if I buy six, I'm actually paying $6 more. And I'm like, if you can't handle the math of a bulk order discount, I don't trust you to handle the math of shipping it to me or logistics or production or any of that. Now, I don't see this often, but it does come up. And sometimes that they, they make no sense. Like, here's all these $10 add-ons. I, I, there is something I don't want to... Uh, hey, if there is a project, I, I wasn't even trying to think of a single. I just, I realized by saying if I backed it, people could technically look and see what I backed. So I don't even want to say I backed it. So there are, there are, there are projects out there who have a bunch of add-ons where in the end, it was cheaper to order all the add-ons than to back for the, the all in. And I've seen that multiple times. Yep. And I'm like, so wait, wait, how is this? Like the math doesn't work. And there were some big ones recently that had that problem. Yeah, it, it's it's strange. And I mean, I'm sure they have some justification for it. Um, but what it ends up looking like is trickery. You know, it looks like yeah. they're trying to scam people. Um, and if like, you're yeah, trying get to get the all in, if you're trying to 29 or two for 60. Yeah, if you're trying to scam people, that's a red flag. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that one worries me a lot. Um, jumping back, I, I know this is the, I've had coffee and stuff and we do have some questions for the chat. I'd like to bring up before we go to the lobby or we'll keep the lobby in, um, canceled projects. I admit, I hate the last minute cancellation, especially if you're funded. 
I get that's kind of what people do now because their funding goals aren't realistic anymore. It used to be that you set your funding goal to what you needed to make the game and get it to backers. To me, that makes sense, and it's what I wish people did, but I get that the platform is involved, and it's all about initial day spikes and getting funded early because people tend to back already funded projects more than not back. But I hate seeing the you're already funded and you cancel. Now, that the way it's canceled, so it's not a red flag, but one of the things I will look at is how many times have you canceled this product before? If it's one, I'm going to look and see what the differences are. What'd you fix? If it's two or more, I'll probably stop digging at that point. To me, that's enough flags. And I'm like, okay, why? Why? All right, you already failed twice. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to give you that third shot. You, everyone else has already waved the red flags behind this. Why, why is it, uh, you know, why is it still existing if everyone has told you to go away? <laughs> yeah. 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 So again, if they, and, and then if I look and it was like canceled, but it was funded, why? Why did you, what, what didn't you, what'd you lie to us about? Right. Like what, what funding goal was wrong? Like if you tell me it's because shipping's gone up 200% in the last two years, I'm like, okay, yep. legit. Again, red flag makes me dig. If the dig is, oh, wow, we totally did not charge enough for shipping. So we had to relaunch right there with you. I fully understand right now. One of the, one of the things I'll say, and we keep talking about digging is one of the red flags. If we are digging back, you know, if we see these canceled projects, uh, when I see those canceled projects, I almost immediately jump in to the discussions, into the actual comments yes. in there. And a lot of times it's something simple. It's, you know, hey, uh, we can't do this because of shipping or, you know, everyone has pointed out a real problem in our rule book and we need mm -hmm. to straighten this out. So we're going to cancel. Yeah, the game's broken. I've yeah, seen that there's, before. There's a number of things where if you just come out and say, look, there is a problem and we are canceling because of this. And you put it out there in your comments to your backers or comments, to, you know, public comments, then that's there for people to see. And all of a sudden, a red flag goes away. You know, all of yep. a sudden, it's like, oh, that's why. Great. No problem yep. at all. Now, that leads me to one that I didn't even think of when working on the notes for tonight that does scare me is uh, private. Everything's private. I can't see it. What are you trying to hide? Yeah. Like, seriously, are you one of those people who thinks that someone's going to steal your board game design? Like, 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 I, I don't know, unless you're talking about people's address or your percentage of backers from certain countries, I don't see what you should, like, I honestly think that all comments should almost be public on every Kickstarter. I realize there might be reasons not to, but in general, keep those big updates open for people, especially if you're then going to go on and do a backer kit or, or a late pledge. I hate when they're like, all right, we've opened up late pledges for this. And I'm like, oh, okay. I looked at this when it came out and it wasn't enough to catch my interest. Let's see what's available now. And I can't see all the updates. Yep. So I'm like, well, I need to be able to see the updates to see if I want a late pledge. Absolutely. Keeping uh, people informed. And that goes not just for the people who have spent money because the people, people who are haven't interested. spent money. Yeah. People who haven't spent money are still a potential income source. So don't lock mm -hmm. them out. Now, since we're talking about updates, we want updates. Give yes. us clear communication. Give us FAQs. Lack of any of that, especially, here's a huge red flag. If I go into the comments and they're public and I see lots of people asking questions and no one replying, that's big. Yeah. If you are not paying attention to the backers you already have and what they're asking, that is a big red flag for me. Yeah, regular discussions. Now, I recently backed a project that was fantastic. Uh, I wish everyone could learn from this project because it was a daily fest of communications. It was, I, I, honestly, it was amazing. I had never had a better communication project from any project I have backed ever. And I don't expect that all the time. This was an exception. But there are also projects I have backed where six months go by without communication. Uh, and that's where everyone starts getting really antsy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, did, why did I give this person my money if they aren't going to yeah, tell that, me anything? Like, um, well, that's legit. That has no basis on whether you backed or not. No, but again, the on the uh, in the in the communication levels of all the different communication, if people are asking questions and they aren't responding, yes, that's you know, it's a huge thing. And you know, hey, maybe maybe they only respond once every couple of days, but you can see. Oh, look, mm. they went through and they did a bulk bunch you of responses. You better have someone responding days. on day one. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, day, like For me, that's a red flag. Big, yeah. If you're not responding to the initial influx of people with questions, like, again, red flag. Maybe there's a reason. 
maybe I don't know. I don't know what your reason. No, I can't. Be. There's no reason. I can't think of a good anyone. reason. Day two, like, uh, maybe. Uh, you're I'm a single person <laughs> launching my again my 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 passion project card game. Yes, maybe. You're overwhelmed. But if like if it's any company that has more than one employee, um, or if you're launching anything that's going to raise, you know, let's say over fifty thousand dollars. That day you hire someone to answer your questions or yep. to do something, whatever you normally do, so you can answer questions, whatever it may be. And and don't just answer backer questions. Uh, I there was a project I was considering backing that I didn't end up backing. And I reached out to them because there were some details on their project that weren't clear. I wanted more information to decide whether or not I was going to back mm -hmm. them. And I asked them and they responded. It was great. They I said, Hey, do you have this particular uh, technical information. And they said, no, we don't hold on. They got back to me a, a few days later and gave me the information I, I had requested. It was fantastic. Uh, and it turns out they couldn't get me the information the, the next set of information I asked for, and I mm. didn't back them, but they were communicating with me. Uh, and that was, that was fantastic. That was, a, that was a nice touch to be able to reach out to someone and get that back and forth, even though I hadn't given them money yet. I'm going to jump over to a couple of things the chat room saying, because I think they kind of fit in here. Uh, so one of them, thoughts on the strategy of upping the amount for the pledge in after the project ends. Again, we're talking about do we back or don't we back? Not Kickstarter best practices or things they should or shouldn't do. So I'm going to skip that for now, but no, that seems terrible to me. But that that's not something I'm going to know ahead of time. Um, but one of them, stretch goals. Do we like stretch goals or not? I, I think they're inevitable, but I also appreciate a project when I open it up and they don't have any and are like, here's my thing. I'm going to give you this thing. You pay me, I give you the thing. I love seeing that nowadays because the stretch goals can get ridiculous. Now, where I the red flags come in is when there's so many that I can't figure out what's what and they overlap and they cross and you can get this package and it kind of goes to all those different backer levels. Well, the same thing for stretch goals and add-ons. And then, I don't know, some... I don't have as much a problem with it that other people do. I know people absolutely hate them. Like I am currently tracking a project that every day is telling me more stuff they're getting. And I'm like, the old concept of stretch goals was like, we're doing better than we thought. So here's some additional stuff that's gone. These are fully planned out. I, I'd be surprised. Like, like there's going to be a few people out there, indie publishers who like suddenly have a hit on their hand and are like, oh, wow, we need stretch goals. But in general, that's all part of the project. And you'll see it because the project will fund and then they'll throw all the rest that they didn't get to for free as if it's a bonus. But that was all there in the first place. Yeah. But to me, that's not a flag either way. Like, like unless it's overly confusing, right? If there's too much. Yeah. One of the things I try to look for is stretch goals should be something that the backers get. Yes. Stretch goals that are add-ons is often a frustrating thing. And that's something that a lot of the big mini the big ones, the, yeah. the, the giant, you know, box o minis plus boards uh things that I'm not gonna back anyway, generally are 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 doing is it's not you you get a couple of things but then after a while it just starts to be here we've unlocked more things you can buy and yes. for me that personally that's a red flag but again i'm not the market for those <laughs> there are people all. who love those though and yes. sharing off their stacks of games it's absolutely yeah um so to go with that what the heck was i gonna say sorry i, I total <laughs> gone um stretch goals uh i don't want to name projects big piles of minis oh my biggest thing with stretch goals is don't sell me an incomplete game that's the red flag when here's the core game which is this little piece of garbage but when you throw all these stretch goals on it it becomes awesome right and of course you won't back at the basic level the basic level is just there for dupes like don't do that Right. Give me a legit game and make the stretch goals useful things to add to that game. I really, I, I've seen it now where it's like, like the, the, the wording of the text, everything is almost like you've got to be an idiot to back at the basic level. And I find that insulting. And I'm like, and also if that's the case, don't produce it. It's, it's the GTFM from role-playing. Like, like, just give me the thing. Yeah. Don't do all this preamble marketing BS. Just give me the thing you wanted to sell me. And and Roger Rogers brought it up in the chat room where he I don't trust projects which give critical game components to yes. backers only or specific backers only. Either way, you know if, mm -hmm. it, if the game is the game and whether it's you know the the game should be the same whether you buy it on the shelf 
two years later when it comes out in retail or you buy it. Maybe your components are different, but mm. the game is still the game. Um, yes. And that's and that's one of those hard things to, to that, that one's to rough. With. And again, it doesn't really fall into flags for me, but it is something I look at. I want kicks like stretch goals to improve the game. I appreciate it when it improves it for everyone. I love those stretch goals. Like everyone gets another mission. Everyone gets a fourth character. And I personally think Kickstarter exclusive should not produce new content. Right. Like 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 a new character in an adventure game is fine. Maybe a side quest, but like, don't give them a whole new dungeon. Don't give them a whole new monster type. Don't give them a whole new book. Like a, a, it, it comes with a starter adventure for an RPG. I don't know. I'm coming up with stuff off the top of my head and without trying to, again, think right. of specific. Quality, physical quality improvements yes. uh, in Kickstarter are one thing. You know, yeah. I'm going to bring Give me out, box inserts. Give bl- me yeah, better components. Let me bling out my game on Kickstarter. But the game that I'm, the actual game is still the same if yes. buddy buys it a retail two years later uh i'm just paying and, for all the extra cool sh- cool stuff <laughs> the other thing too is i don't mind them if you sell me the stretch goals separate so i can back again i'm not trying to mention names i can get the base game and if you back the kickstarter you also get the expansions but everyone else can also get the expansions they just got to pay separate yep. totally cool with that yeah yeah absolutely and uh but and and if and if you don't offer the bling later that's fine yeah, it's that's just fine. but the content the actual mechanical content of the game should be out there for everyone yes. because i don't want to be able to say oh yeah i played gloomhaven completely random here this is i played gloomhaven and john's never played gloomhaven. i've never played gloomhaven and and uh, the, your buddy over there is like well i played gloomhaven but it was nothing like that game yes and and that's a problem mm-hmm. if, if two people are playing a game they should be playing the same game they should be yes. able to talk about their experiences playing the game and when there's completely different content, you lose that. All right, moving on to other red flags. I do not like <laughs> this fits with what we're talking about, stretch goals, add-ons, backer levels, swag that is not part of the game. I This is one of the ones that I, I remember, Sean, when we were first talking Kickstarter, he's like, why not? And I'm like, no, this is yeah. terrible. I have seen too many projects fail for offering stuff like T-shirts, jackets, hats, plushies super large cloth maps um uv coated posters all stuff that's just swag swag is terrible swag is large and it takes up bigger packages and it increases your shipping stuff can get more easily damaged if you're going to send an art print you need to pack that completely differently than if you send something else like throw in a postcard in the box is okay but don't sell me a Gloomhaven, you know, bomber jacket to wear. Yeah, and it, this this depends on a lot of different things. So uh, one of the things I've backed a lot is comic books. I've backed a number of superhero comic books. And one thing they tend to do is throw stickers in or trading cards in. But Those fit- you're shipping a comic book and that you're, keep, that you're fighting to keep as flat as possible anyway. It doesn't matter. It doesn't add anything to shipping, and that's fine. But as soon as you see a T-shirt or buttons um Mm -hmm. those take up space and they change your packing and they add weight to shipping and they don't add anything to the product and they add another source to your thing you now have a different production company because steve jackson games isn't going to print your t-shirts you're now dealing with t-bubby or whatever or some other company to try to get that stuff there to ship so while your board game producer may get you your thing and the rule book producer may get you your thing, you don't want to hold up the game because the hats haven't come in yet. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's 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 a whole bunch of problems when you start diversifying your deliverables. Yes. Um, the more SKUs you have to deliver, the more problems exactly. you're getting into and the harder it is. And, you know, maybe you're a major company that deals with this sort of thing all the time. But even, even then, then, even then, you don't necessarily want to have to deal with it. Um, you know, but if, again, if, but if you're not a major company, if you're not, you know, a huge company that is already dealing with a number, of, a large number of SKUs, if you're just a guy starting off or a small company with three games, please don't add more stuff yeah. just because you think it's cool and you think it's going to add, you know, ramp up the numbers. Ramp like, up the numbers for your game. 
have have a merch store on your website and link mm, to it. Like if people it. want your merch, let them buy your merch. That's fine. I'm not trying to say don't have merch, but don't throw it in as part of your Kickstarter. And again, maybe this is a personal opinion. I'm, we've got some people in the chat saying they don't mind it that much, but like I know projects who failed because of it. That, 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 well, not necessarily failed. Like people got their stuff, but like the people sending it went out of business because they couldn't afford it. And it wasn't the game that killed them. It was the t-shirts. And yep. in one case, it was jackets, right? Yep. I, I like, honestly, like to me, that's a perfect. Like, sell me your merch. That's perfectly fine. Heck, we are currently talking to someone in Ottawa to start producing Canadian merch for us. We're probably like, unless we do a Kickstarter for our podcast, and that is the physical reward. I don't think we're going to be offering merch with, you know, Moe's D20 game. He finally <laughs> writes and sells. It's just not a thing. Yep. All right. Minor red flag for me. This is the best game ever. This was designed by gamers for gamers. A totally unique take on deck building. Marketing keywords. A good game doesn't need buzzwords. And the more you use, the more I think you're trying to hide the fact and get me excited about a game that isn't at all exciting. Now, I worked in marketing. Maybe that's what it is. But that scares me away. I have seen a large number of projects that are generally by people outside of yes. the industry. They are um, wizards. There's, at, there's games they're wizards at marketing. About. Yeah, they're they're wizards at marketing, uh, and and they they've got a whole lot of clout from outside of the board game industry. Yes, and they had a great idea, and they turn into the pitch man, the person on Shark Tank who is mm -hmm. trying to, you know, sell something that they've got regardless of the quality. And maybe it's great quality, maybe it's not. But if you have to push those words and the buzzwords and the, 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 the sound, you know, put too much effort into selling your project, why are you putting that much effort into selling your project? Yeah. It's, it's something in life, door-to-door -door salesmen I will never buy from because if you have to come to my door to make me want your product, <laughs> I clearly don't need it enough. And it's the same with buzzwords. Uh, it's the same with buzzwords. If you have to work that hard to sell yeah. me your, pro your, your product, I probably don't want it. And I got to admit, if you throw in a million tech magazines, as in they supported by and liked by and reviewed by, again, you kind of scare me away. Why do you need that much hype to sell me your game? Just sell me a good game. And a lot of that, I mean, generally, I will have noticed that way back at the beginning when we're looking at, when we're doing our backer research like who the person yes. uh, who the producer is you'll see this person and you go oh they you know write for blah blah this. blah from zdnet you know right exactly and it's you know they just called in all their buddies and hey you know all all the people who i do reviews for all the companies i work for are going to throw their logos on here because we're all cool buds Great. And that's awesome. But that doesn't in any way like said, make it a good red game. flag. <laughs> I, the, some uh, exploding kittens there. I'm calling out a specific game. Damn. Exploding kittens wouldn't exist right without that. And it's uh, not my favorite game, but it's a solid game and lots of people enjoy it. And it went mass market, which awesome. Good job. Oatmeal. Um, but there you had someone who writes comics who got a bunch of big names to support them to get the word out in the marketing. Yeah. But it's a red flag. That's it's, again, it's maybe the best game. By gamers for gamers, I, I hate that term all the time. That that is an instant turn off for me. I'm like, just because you play, like, like who's going to claim otherwise? What I what I see a lot of the time is is you'll see this, you know, the totally unique uh, way of doing this. The the first time this has ever existed in a deck builder, and yes. they've got zero. They they've never built a game before. Their biography says that they've been working on this game for eight years. I, that's and actually another flag. <laughs> it's it's you know okay. You have put your heart and soul into this, but you've not done any market research. Yeah. You know if you're using these, if you terms, haven't gone to Board Game Geek and Googled your game name, yeah, no, absolutely. It's there. There's a there's some definite red flags when you start using these fancy terms because most of the time it means you haven't done your research yeah you're just using you're doing seo and not actually selling me a game another one this isn't a red flag this is a please 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 tell me about the game don't make me scroll to the bottom 75 percent of your kickstarter before you tell me what it's about and this that, is that, and this is getting worse it is this is getting a lot worse you're getting so much stuff up top now what I think a lot of these designers are doing is putting it all into the top video. Well, guess what? Maybe I'm different, but I'm not looking at your video. If 
I have gotten far enough into your project and I'm really, really interested. I will probably look at your video, but odds are good that I just want to scroll down your project. I don't want to sit through mm -hmm. your marketing pitch. I don't want you to sell to me actively through a video. I want to scroll down real quickly and see. And so if you're hiding all the actual game content in a video, you've probably lost me and you probably won't get me as a salesperson. Yeah. Now, what I think happens, and I don't know this for sure, but what I, I have a feeling happens with most of these projects is if you went day one, it would tell you about the game. But then they keep updating it so that the what they're trying to do now is here's our stretch goals. Here's my new thing. Here's what you're going to get now. Here's our hundred new things. Here's our new mini sculpts. And I think people keep throwing them at the top. And I think they often, like I, we spent how long looking at a specific project and we could not figure out if it was a cooperative or competitive game. We had to go to board game geek and check the side categories to find out what kind of game it is. I'm not going to back your game. If I don't know what your game's about. Yeah. If I, if, if I actually get to the point of hitting control F, and searching for keywords to try and figure something out, you have got a problem on yes. your site. <laughs> and I get concerned that even if it is a good game, that like, can you write a rule book? You can't write a Kickstarter page. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and there's there's a lot of a lot about page layout that's very different. And this is one of the ones that is hugely different between oh, yes. sites. Huge. This is this is a big problem, actually on some sites because some sites are deliberately um i hate to say hiding but really hiding information um from people who visit this site uh who are like mo and i just want to roll, roam around and look for information uh and it, it's kind of hidden in strange ways so right up front get out there and i'm not asking you necessarily to post your rules Although if you do, I'm probably oh, going to read them. The, the, I'm probably going to read that them. That goes down here. <laughs> the um, one we get to green flags, or we'll just mention now. Poster rules, please. Yeah. Okay, and I, I, I'm, I'm sort of on the fence about that one because I do see some of the giving away too much information. You know, you don't want to give away what you're sell everything that you're selling. But at the same time, you know, especially you know, in a mini, if it's a mini game, no one's buying it for the rules. So yeah. if your rules aren't there for someone to look at and figure out whether or not it's a good game, that's a big thing. But yeah. there are other games where I can sort of understand, you know, especially if you've got virtual tabletops or whatever ways to play the game, not just mm -hmm. throwing the whole rule book up. Yeah, I got it. The, the, again, that goes into the greens. That's not yeah, a red we're, flag. We're, we're shifting here, sort of. We're, we're shifting a bit, but I do have a couple I want to bring yeah. up uh, before we get there. There was something and I forget what it was. So shipping, I, I don't even know what to tell you nowadays, but it better be reasonable. And the red flag nowadays is when it's too low. It's not when shipping's too high. It's when it's too low that I'm like, whoa, well, how or, do you think you're going to ship me this or a for lack 30 of, bucks? Or a lack of information about shipping. At all. If they yes. haven't, if they clearly haven't done the work to figure out ballpark what their shipping is going to be, even if they just, because if they just say, we'll figure out shipping later, mm, hold on. Wait, I, if you haven't done the work to give me an idea, why, you know, what else haven't you done the work for? Though I fully get people doing that right now because they have no idea. Well, yeah, yeah, but there's you can have no idea and say right now, you know, today this is what today the shipping, shipping is, would cost. But us we this. aren't going to shop, but we aren't going to charge until the project mm -hmm. ships. There's got to be something there that shows that you have done some level of due diligence on yes. shipping, because shipping is a, you know, the core Massive portion, <laughs> the, the the core aspect of deliverables. You know, you're mm -hmm. delivering by shipping. So yes. show me that you've thought about it. Yeah, and unless the you know the person making the Kickstarter lives down the street, <laughs> it's got to get shipped. Got to get shipped. Yeah. So, and again, this is going back to more money things. Is your funding amount? So, does your project scale? Well, we talked about this a little bit already, and and you know whether or not you know what what you're starting with. Hey, you know it's your first project, and why are you starting at three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars? But the actual of financial amount funded. So. If it is a $700 funding amount, a small little, you know, maybe this should have been on Etsy project that only asked for $700, but suddenly has $300,000. How sure are you that this person is going to be able mm -hmm. to scale up to that level? Yes. Um, you know, scaling is huge. There are a large number of projects out there 
that have become wildly uh, successful and collapsed under the yes. weight of their success. Which often the problem is that whole thing we're talking about stretch goal creep is they start thinking they need to offer more. We have this much. I need to reward. Oh my God, we're doing so well. I need to offer more. And I wish more back creators were like, wow, I'm just getting way more money than I thought I would for this thing. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's where they get buried is the scale. Now in general, it should mean you're making more money because you should be able to produce whatever it is you're producing at a larger scale and get a better price, which is definitely a huge thing. I went talking board games and role-playing game box. When you're, when you're talking cardboard and paper, Bulk is huge. If yeah. you can switch from doing a 1,000 print run to a 5,000 print run, that's massive. And if you can go from 5,000 to 10,000, that's massive. But and I think the actual, from what I've heard, it's actually like 1,000 to 3,000 is, is more the big jumps. But Right. But at the same time, if you've got, you know, all sorts of extras you're offering and, you know, the T-shirts and all the other things, all yeah. the other red flags that we've already been talking about, and these numbers are just going far beyond clearly what you had expected you have to pause before you oh and a lot of people think oh look it's funded that's great that's perfectly safe well hold on mm -hmm. there is too such a thing as too much of a good thing well yeah once you get into that size you got to warehouse the stuff yeah. if i'm expecting to ship a board game out of my house and sell 100 copies and suddenly i get 3,000 copy orders where do those games go yeah. Right now I'm having to pay for a used store or get a thing in my yard or I got to contact, like, I don't even know, yep. you know, what, what you do at that point and that's not free and you pay for every day stuff is sitting there and so on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's just one of those things you need to, uh, you need to pay attention because you, the, the goal is to get to the end line and get all this product yes. out to the clients yes. and, and hopefully make some money. And you don't go out of business doing it. Absolutely. One of the stretch goals I really enjoy, and I, I really only see this happening at RPGs for the most part. Pay people is more. Pay people more. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, pay people more. That's a perfectly acceptable stretch goal. Um, I don't think I've ever seen that on a board game product. No. Well, I mean, hopefully that means people are getting paid properly in the board game world in the first place, but I, I doubt it. Um, <laughs> let's be honest here. Uh, artists are rarely getting paid their true value uh, in any Industry. artists editors, editors writers yeah. <laughs> not just artists well i mean editors and uh, writers are uh, writers i clump in with artists in most of these these times but yeah when you get into you know the rule book creators and the solo the, game players and all these other people play testers know, play them pay them more and 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 don't you know maybe don't add that extra giant miniature that doesn't really add anything to the game or that uv coating yeah, absolutely. Think about the environment, folks. UV coating just makes your cardboard unrecyclable. Who recycles their games? Um, <laughs> no one's going to recycle the game. All right. This took longer than I thought it would, which is awesome in a way. It's a good chat. And we got some good stuff in the chat room we'll get to in a bit. Uh, some some green flags. I'm, I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Like I, I hate being on the side of the bad, but I think that was the more useful segment of the show, the more useful information. Um, so the biggest one, have you done it before? Had Like if you've already had a massive Kickstarter and you delivered it and I got my copy of the game and the game was awesome and I didn't see any editing issues and I had fun playing it and now you've got a new one and the game looks just as good and you're using an established person and that one's already sold and then you're going to do it again. If you previously sent people stuff and they're happy with what they got and I can especially see a track record, like once you're getting up to three, four times, I'm going to trust you a lot more it's it's going to eliminate a lot of those red flags and i'll be like i i um, eh, again i'm not going to mention companies <laughs> there are certain people i would have no qualms about backing and i wouldn't I, like i it just look at the game and go wow that looks cool i'm interested in that i'm gonna back like done yep absolutely so, there are there are a hundred percent projects where i have you know not even gone through half the red flag checking because of who and what was being presented I said, especially with the previously preview. Now, if they don't, if it's someone established, if it's an established, I'm going to use the term brand. If it's an established brand and established publisher, I, I'm going to trust them more because they can already produce games and ship them around the world. And I can buy their game at my local game store. So I know they understand the distribution channel and they obviously are paying people to produce games already. That is going to, again, it's a green flag. It's a, oh, it's by them. I know them. Yep. 
absolutely it makes it just greases the wheels that much more for it to enable them to get our you know to get our money it's yeah yeah sure i feel confident in them uh and that doesn't necessarily mean you know the giant name brands no, this could be a brand you know of someone you know on twitter who you've seen go through some of this stuff before you know it's it's yep. joe from twitter who delivered you know four rpgs last year great or you know you've you've seen and bought a bunch of their stuff on drive through rpg and they're putting out something new yes um it doesn't have to be that big you know the big brands well also we say big even the big brands aren't that big like unless we're talking Hasbro, yeah, there's only Asmodee. one big brand, and even Has two. Asmodee isn't as big as Hasbro. No, they're bigger uh, actually because it's a French conglomerate that owns more than just game industry stuff. Yeah. They're 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 huge. Um, yeah, I like we're talking big, but like like Grand Gamers Guild is is Mark Spector, <laughs> like in Stronghold Games for years was Stephen Bonacore, and they have lots of great games. So just as an example, uh, next is designers. You throw up. A Steffenfeld Kickstarter, I'm going to be tempted to ignore Red Flag because I want to see the new Steffenfeld game. <laughs> um, same with RPG designers. You see, I, I'll admit I'm not a huge Monty Cook fan, but that was the first name that came to mind. Robin Laws. Throw up a Robin Laws game, I'm going to dig deeper. As a green flag, like, oh, what's Robin doing now? I dig Robin's style of narrative gaming and his unique approach to mechanics. Um, I have a Robin Laws game back there that I've kickstarted, and there's a Monty Cook one, which is why I mentioned those two, because they're literally behind me. So if you've got a well-known designer, that's obviously going to be a green flag for me. Um, same with board games. I'd, like, you throw out the, the right names, and there are people who have published a ton of games. You throw out you know, the bigger names, like Anton Bowser or whatever. I got a t-shirt full of them. I'm not wearing it today. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It's you know, And again, once you move on from designers uh more things we talked about again that as much as it's a red flag to not be there good communication is the green flag right mm -hmm. if you flip if i flip over to that communication tab and i can immediately see that they're interacting with people and telling and things. interacting well not yeah. just attacking yeah, yeah. their backers uh if if there's an faq uh yep. even if it even if there's just a couple of entries if there's an fa i i've seen a lot of things where there's no faq and i'm like i don't believe there's no questions about this not at all. There's no project you're going to put out there that doesn't have questions. So if you've got a couple of questions on your FAQ, um, that's you know great to see. And updates. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if it's if it's not day one, if it's not still within the first you know six hours, there should be updates. Mm -hmm. So, all right, another one. Lots of friends backing. I, if you have a Kickstarter account, I'm sure you have your notifications on and you get told when your friend's back. And that's our friends, not the creator's friends specifically. Yes, <laughs> yes. Creator's friends backing could be a red flag. Um, not that you always see them. But like there are certain people that I know have similar tastes in games than me that if I start, if I see them back something, I immediately click through and I throw it in our show notes to talk about on Sunday. Otherwise, what usually happens is I see a bunch of people. I, I see the first email and I'm like, eh, second, third, fourth. And then sometimes, like when uh, the, the latest, when Matt Coville launched his latest RPG one, my email was like ping, 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 ping. And it was like everyone I knew from G Plus was back in this project. And I'm like, oh, I got to look at this. I'm like, oh, it's for 5e D&D. &D, I don't care. But it was a green flag. Like, okay, the number of people I trust backing this and I like their opinion of, I'm like, all right, this looks like it's worth a shot. Yep, absolutely. But you also have to know your friends. Because, for instance, I have a friend who has a rather well-paying job and loves role-playing to the extent where they back a large number of 5e projects specifically yep. and i have a strong feeling that they are more forgiving of projects that aren't going to do well yeah. uh, because they have the income to be able to so they are out there supporting the industry more than necessarily strongly evaluating the market uh, and getting. so know that you've got know that some people are that way and mm -hmm. to take those recommendations with a grain of salt. Now, I will also add that if it's my friend's project, not they're backing the project, but it's my friend's project, I'm going to be more likely to back just to support them. Even if I don't give, I don't care what I'm getting out of it. Yeah. I have backed projects that I have no interest and to go with that supporting a good cause. 
There is a massive RPG rule book back there that was 10 times thicker than I thought it would be that looks fascinating, but totally, I, you know, I, I might give it a shot at some point, but it's really not my jam that I supported because it supported people who deserve to be supported. Yep. And, and one of those things is, look, keep an eye out for Pledge Without a Reward stuff. If there mm -hmm. are a ton of people pledging without a reward, there's two possibilities. One, there's a huge backer kit on the back end where they're all you're just going to add up all the money later. Yep. And that's something we talked about earlier. But it's also just a sign of support. For instance, Garinto. I Garinto wasn't something that I was going to uh, play with my family. So I wasn't going to back it. But we love the project. So yeah. they got some of my money, even though because I wanted to support the concept uh mm -hmm. despite the fact that me having a copy of garinto was going to be ridiculous <laughs> yeah it's not likely you were going to play yeah so all right we've been at this for about an hour so i think we've had enough time on this topic right now now we will be jumping into the lobby i do see lots more chat in the chat room which i gotta say chat room has been awesome tonight thank you very much and for those of you listening at home you should have been here <laughs> All right, well, that's it for our talk on what will and won't encourage us to back a tabletop crowdfunding project. Now, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to our website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or just hit us up on social media where I can be found as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our preview of Hellbringer a card-driven roguelike inspired by games like Diablo. Thank you, Max Gauthier, for sending us a prototype copy of your game to check out. So Hellbringer is being designed by fellow Canadian Max Gauthier, who will be and will be published by his production company, The Additional Smash, after what he hopes will be a successful Kickstarter later this year. Now, Hellbringer is being designed primarily as a solo experience, but can be played with groups of up to four players. No, our prototype only went to three. Each game of Hellbringer lasts at most two hours, but potentially much less if you die early in the game. Before we go further, I do want to stress that the copy of Hellbringer we played was still a prototype. Art was not finalized, design elements may change, and most importantly, the rules are still being tweaked and modified. This is a preview, not a review, and anything we talk about here could change before the final game is released. Now, Hellbringer is a card-driven dungeon-crawling game where you choose a character and then progress through four levels of a dungeon, from the crypt to the tomb of the demon. On your trip ever deeper, you will encounter monsters, find much-needed equipment, learn new skills, and level up your character. Combat features a unique line of sight mechanism that represents the dungeon getting darker as you go deeper. Can you defeat the demon at the bottom of the dungeon, or will you be overcome by them and their minions? Since the copy of Hellbringer we were sent is still a prototype, we didn't record our usual unboxing video. But I will say physically, everything was looking pretty good. Yeah, I agreed. Uh, the card design, the iconography, the artwork we did get to see, some was finalized, some wasn't, all looked good. Uh, while many of the cards did note the art wasn't finished, the ones that were I liked what I saw. The boards included were functional, and I particular excuse me, and I particularly liked the dry erase portion of the player boards, where you actually track your character stats while playing. The boards were of a jigsaw fit type, and they did what they needed to do with places for the decks and cards that were needed. Now, where things did fall apart a bit is with the rule book and the included campaign book. Now, physically, they looked pretty good. They were well laid out, lots of white space. There were examples, and there were some other solid design elements. But sadly, the translation of these rules did leave a lot to be desired. Yeah, not only the translation, but the organization of the topics lacked a lot. Uh, lacked a lot. Uh, combined with the uh, with no index, there was a lot of page yeah. flipping to try and grasp the rules or find a clarification when we did ran run into something we either missed or or had forgotten from the rules. Yeah, it was one of those rule books where you're like, I know it's in here somewhere. Where is it? And we did have an issue with that. Now, I don't want to harp on these rules too much because at this point, the game's still in development. And I do have to thank Max for being very accessible during all of our plays of Hellbringer. He had an answer for all of our questions, which was great. And with his help, we were able to figure out and play Hellbringer successfully. Speaking of figuring out how to play, how about we move on to that? 
Why don't you summarize how to play Hellbringer? Well, you start by building the dungeon deck. This involves taking all of the core cards. It's a significant chunk of cards, shuffling them and creating four decks. Each of these decks, you're going to shuffle in a number of combat cards based on the number of players and a story card. You're then going to shuffle them all, put a location card at the bottom of each of the deck, and then stack them so that you're progressing through the different levels, the crypt followed by the cave, then hell, and then finally the demon's tomb. This not only gives you the flow of play, but a large tail of cards to support you, even if it takes you a while to fight that last enemy. I got to see that in person the other day. Now, the monster deck is built next, which involves shuffling the two monster decks separately, the starter monsters and the main monsters, and then putting a set number of random beginner monsters on top of the standard ones, again, based on the number of players. They make sure to put some easier creatures on top based on the player count to ease you into the dungeon. Mm -hmm. Next, you're going to pick a scenario to play. Uh, every scenario features two sets of rules. There's like a normal mode and a difficult mode where, as far as I could tell, all of the normal modes were the same. It was pick any character you want, and the only thing that would change is which demon you're going to fight at the end. All the heroes are able to use, and that's it. Now, the thing that does change, though, is the story on the different missions. As well, at the more difficult level, the choice of characters could be restricted, and there will always be special rules, which tend to be triggered by the story cards, like adding more damage dice to the opponents or players losing skills as they delve deeper and so on. Now, the game currently includes nine scenarios and a tutorial. Now, the tutorial is just something to learn the game that uses a smaller deck with only two locations in it. Now, the straightforward deck builds here really do make this game quick to get mm -hmm. up and playing with no matter what level, scenario, or player count you want to use. Now, everyone then picks a character to play, of which there are six to choose. You've got warrior, hunter, paladin, druid, monk, and sorcerer, pretty typical fantasy character classes. You're going to take the starting card for that character and add them to a starting hand of four cards drawn from the bottom of the dungeon deck. Again, you're not delving the dungeon yet. You're just getting them from the core cards. Now, the card for the character is placed on your player board, and the bottom of the board is filled out with your character's starting stats. Again, this is done with dry erase, because the marker, the, the stats here are going to change a lot. Now, the stats in Hellbringer are health, armor, vision, action points, skill, and hand limit. There is also a chance for one of the players to trade in a card from those starting four for a healing potion to start mm -hmm. with, but only one for the whole table. This is a good plan for multiplayer games. <laughs> yes. Now, once everyone has their characters ready, you're going to read off the campaign book for the first location, and you're going to read the tome card. These are both actually, sorry, the location card and the tome card, and the location card is going to tell you to read the campaign book. Both that location card and that first tome card are on the pre-printed on the board. Now, the first location is the graveyard. It's going to have you reveal a number of monsters equal to the number of players plus one. Then the tome card tells you to read your background information. Then you're ready for the first player's turn. Now, when you first start, you won't have much to do. Most players are only getting one action as a default. Now, on your turn, you can take a number of actions equal to your action points. These actions include attacking monsters in play, using an ability on a card, learning new skills, assigning a companion to your character, equipping items, enchanting those items, using potions, using uh, defense cards, and trading cards. No, trading cards only happens in co-op play, which kind of makes sense. Now, each card in the game shows how many actions they take to use. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail of all the different card types and the timing and how that all works, but I do want to call it a couple things that I think stick out in this game. So equipment cards are placed on your player board where you have four specific slots that are color-coded. Each piece of equipment will have to match the slot, and there are some equipment pieces that will take up more than one slot. These tend to be two-handed weapons. Now, pretty much every piece of equipment is going to modify your basic stats. Weapons will also give you attack options. Now, as noted earlier, all the improvements are tracked by dry erase at the bottom of your board. So you equip the card and then update your stat. Note, there are also items that improve other players' stats yep. in co-op play. So keeping a close track is important. As in a group game especially, it would be really hard to go backwards and figure out what your stats should be if you had messed up along the way. Yes, one of the things you will have to remember is if you lose any of these cards, you're then going to have to adjust again, probably putting things back down. Now, skill cards work a little differently from those. So many of the skill cards are related to one of the six classes in the game. Well, anyone playing can use any skill once, 
using a skill that matches your class lets you keep it in play besides your player board so you can use it again and again. And that's part of the tableau aspect, tableau building aspect of the game. Now your skill stat determines how many of these skills you can have and play at once with characters like the sorcerer getting way more than say the warrior. And just because you've learned a spell doesn't mean you don't still have to pay to use it. Right, but it's there to be used over and over again. Now each character also has one slot to hold a companion. These you only have to pay for once, and then once they're in play, they're going to do their action every round for free. Now, one character class, the Druid, is an exception to this rule, but if you follow the rules clearly printed on the cards, it's easy to see how they can have more companions. Now, Hellbringer has a very unique combat system, which starts out with the pretty cool line of sight rules. Now, every character has a sight stat, and every monster has a visibility stat. A character can only attack monsters in their sight if the sight stat beats, meets or beats the mob's visibility. Now, the central board is used to track this, and it's divided into three areas to make this easier. If you're playing with uh, multiple players, especially, you've got row for mobs visible for ev to everyone, mobs visible to at least one character, and mobs no one can see. Now, in general, you can only attack monsters you can see, but some cards do make exceptions. Now, this is a bit more complex with multiple players, as some can see creatures in the middle and others can't. But in practice, it never actually confused us as it's really easy to check out quickly. Yeah. Now, actual attacking is done by rolling a number of custom six-sided dice. These come in red, which feature fives, tens, and blanks, and green dice that feature fives and even more blanks. You pick a mob to attack and roll all your dice in one big pool. If the total on your dice meets or beats the target's health plus their armor, that mob is defeated. If not, nothing happens. This is important. Note, there's no tracking of hit points in this game. Every attack is all or nothing. You defeat your target or you don't. Now, we understand this is going to be a red flag for a lot of players. Mm. But given the game's origin as a solo play, it makes sense and really minimizes the bookkeeping required and keeps it as that quick, fast-to-play game. Yes, it definitely helps with the speed and the, and the, the less fiddliness, right? Now, of course, there's a few more things to take into account, like there's rules for combining different attacks to take down bigger monsters. Many of the monsters, skills, and equipment cards modify this system. You're going to find things like attacks that ignore armor, skills that let you reroll dice, and so on. As well, thematically, the green dice are a poison attack, while the red dice are your physical attacks. Now, when you do kill your target, you get to take the card and use it to level up your character. There's a spots on the side of the board with slots for all of the game stats. So you slot a monster into any stat and it goes up. This is how you get more actions, more health, more armor, more skill slots, better vision, and so on. And trust me, you need to kill some things to have a chance to be able to kill more things. Now, thankfully, you can share your kills in multiplayer. So if one person is doing all the killing, they can give their kills to others to help level up everyone's stats. Which came into play a lot in our games. Now, once you've used all your actions, you then refill your hand with cards from the dungeon deck based on your card hand limit. This represents getting deeper into the dungeon. Now, most cards are just going to be added to your hand to be used the next round, but the deck also includes some of those other special cards we shuffled in when setting up, right? There's combat cards, which are going to spawn new monsters. Story cards, which give all the characters some type of benefit and have you read the next section of the story. And location cards that represent reaching a new level of the dungeon, which again are probably going to spend more monsters as well as make things more difficult for you. Now, the important thing to note here is that monster cards can be added due to drawing combat cards just before the monsters go. And players don't get to draw extra cards for their hands when drawing any of these special cards. So you may not end up with a full hand. Now, this is a game where cycling your deck and digging for cards is not what oh. you want to do. Your best chance is to maximize the cards you get to the best of your ability. No matter what you're getting, you get. If you can use it, you should try. Now, once all characters have taken their actions, used up all their action points, the monsters go. What they do is determined by another custom D6. This will show you if the monsters attack your companions, if they attack you, if they attack you and your companions, or if they take up a defensive position. Now, the defensive position just causes you to discard two cards and there's no attack. Now, the mobs are attacking companions and you don't have one, you get hit instead. Now, while it's nice to not get attacked once in a while, 
discarding two cards from your hand, as we were talking, can be devastating. Yes. Again, that deck is how deep you are. Every time you draw, you may be making things harder on yourself. Now, when the monsters attack, unlike the heroes, they don't worry about line of sight. Every round, every monster attacks using one giant dice pool. You just add them up for everything you play. Add up all the deck dice and the monsters, roll the big pile of them, and apply the results to everyone as indicated on the monster roll, or the monster action die. Now, here again, it's all or nothing. The monster's total damage is higher than your combined health and armor, or your companion's combined health and armor, you're dead. That is, unless you have a defense card, like a potion or some other defensive skill. Now, again, this takes a bit to get used to. Like, you're going to want to get hit for 60 and take 60 off your hit points, and that's not it. As long as you have a combined armor and health of 60, you're fine. There are no hit points in this game. You survive or die. There's nothing to track between combat rounds. It's all about planning, keeping an eye on what sort of maximum the enemy is going to be capable of yes. doing and have options to mitigate some of that damage or else. Now, if you do die in a solo game, that's it. Game over, man. But if you die in, this, in the cooperative game, you just flip your character card. You let the other players loot your stuff and then sit back and cheer them on, hoping for a resurrection card to come up. Uh, there are a few of these in this deck, not a lot, as well as a chance to resurrect everyone when you get to the fourth story card. So, no, this is one of the more problematic aspects of the game we found, as not only is it a player sitting back and not doing anything, except maybe helping roll the monsters, but you're also unable to advance. Yeah. So you're very likely to be at a severe disadvantage when and if you do resurrect. Now, the game continues on like this until you get to the last location card. That'll have you reveal the demon. Now, again, the demon's set by the scenario that was chosen and will be a card for a particularly badass monster that's going to take a lot of damage, do a lot of damage itself, and you're going to need to do all of that damage at once because, again, the all or nothing combat system, you've got to hit that 135 to take down the dragon in one hit. Now, if you do manage to kill this demon, no, you don't have to kill any of the minions in play. You could just focus on the demon. You win. Congratulations. Rebuild the dungeon deck, pick a different scenario, pick a different character, and delve again. Now, I think that covers the basics of gameplay without getting into too many details. Well, now let's start talking about what we thought of Hellbringer. Yeah, so I got to start by saying the prototype copy we got was a bit of a hot mess, and that's being polite. Uh, I would go so far as to say completely unplayable as written. Yeah, as noted earlier, thankfully, the designer was easy to reach and very forthcoming with clarifications and advice. Now, I also, before getting prepped for the weekend to play, found a pretty good actual play on the Hellbringer website. It's hellbringergame.com. And to be honest, that was the only reason we were able to even sit here and talk about the game. It was just with the box. We wouldn't have, we would have, a, if, if it had, all I had was that box and I sat down and we were having to tell you about it right now, this would be a much different preview. Yeah, I did uh, initially try to play with only the rule book, no videos or assistance from uh, the designer, and it was not a success. Now, with all this talking to the designer, the one thing that did become very clear as we were playing was this game is not done. It's still in the middle of the development process and still being play tested. Actually, we provided Max with so much feedback based on us trying to learn his game that our group's now going to be credited as official playtesters on the game. Which is cool, but I think not quite what we were expecting when agreeing to preview this game. Yeah, I gotta admit this was a bit frustrating. Um, I much prefer, prefer reviewing completed games. And honestly, I really gotta stop saying yes to these preview requests. Uh, the big takeaway, I think, though, that we all had with Hellbringer is that it shows a lot of promise. And having a designer that's willing to listen to feedback is going to be great for the final product. Now, while I hope this game is still a distance from being on Kickstarter, I do think it belongs there once yep. they nail down how to explain the game to strangers in English. Well, with that, let's move on to talking about what we think makes this game look so promising. And I want to start with the theme. So Hellbringer is meant to be a roguelike card game and to me, it really does feel like a roguelike. And by roguelike, I mean rogue, like going back to the origin of the term. I played a ton of rogue back on the Amiga. Yes, we're old guys. Um, I played rogue. I, I played with the at and the dog walking with me. And I played many, many versions of rogue over the years. 
And the fact that every game you play builds a completely random dungeon that's just filled with some timing cards that progress the story and spawn monsters, it really gave me that old school, purely random dungeon delver feel. Things like the fact you could get a hugely powerful monster showing up early or something that has such high visibility that it won't be able to see it ever, yet it'll keep poking you every turn, following you around. Plus, there's always the fact you can end up with a super powerful skill or weapon in your starting hand just by chance. To me, those are staples of a good roguelite, and I enjoyed finding them in board game form. So this game is filled with random, and it is designed that way, which will, is, of course, turn off some players. True. But not, I think, the ones who are used to the experiences from, say, Slay the Spire and other even modern roguelikes, as well as, uh, you know, old folks like us. <laughs> Now, the other thing I like thematically was just how many monsters show up and will be defeated during the game. I really did get that feel, especially playing solo, of going after wave after wave of mobs trying to take me out. And there's that tension that one more mob adding one more die might be that one to take me out and I feel like I'm going to get overwhelmed. The physical nature of grabbing a larger and larger dice pool even adds to that. Yeah, there are even times where you didn't want to kill that last monster because yeah. you know in attacking them you may be spawning a whole new group of monsters that are going to do way worse than the one guy yes. in the back who's just pinging away and can't hurt you and just like any good roguelike sometimes it happens you are overwhelmed this is not an easy game and you can be eliminated pretty early in this game now that alone is going to be enough for some people to say heck no i'm not interested but when playing solo, it just means reshuffle the cards and play again. But playing cooperative is where I find it's a bit of a problem. It can mean a lot of downtime because when you die, you just sit there and watch everyone else play, hoping someone gets something that'll let you resurrect. And it was this that makes me think that it may not be an ideal three or more player game. It works, but the downtime is something we don't really like to see in modern games. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we found it could actually be a bit of an emotional drain to the excitement at the table. Uh, and that was and that was problematic. And as Sean said, even if you do eventually get that resurrection, you come back, you're so underpowered, that you just die again, which was another issue. Now, what I liked even less is being alive in the game and having turns where you can't do anything. This was particularly a problem for my wife. Due to the random nature of the dungeon deck, it's very possible you could get a hand of cards you can't use. Either they have too high an action cost or you draw skills for the other classes. So in, in playing cooperative, you want to give those away. So all I draw is a bunch of paladin skills. Well, it's way better if I give them to the paladin. And it leaves me with nothing to use on my own. Now, this is compounded by the fact that when you refill your hand, you don't get to replace those special cards you draw. So here I have a small hand at the end of my turn. I only have two cards left and I draw two combat cards and a, and a story card. Well, I still only have two cards the next round. Plus, then there's the one action on the monster die that can come up and make you discard cards. Like, we had turns where players started their turn and they had no cards in their hands. And they couldn't see the monster, so their turn was, I do nothing, your turn. Yeah, and you, you can build a maximum hand size with skills of anything, but still have no cards. And if your attack count isn't high enough, it may be impossible for you to do any damage to the available monsters. Now, I do know lack of cards in hand is one of the things the designer is working on fixing. Actually, the latest version of the rules I took a quick look at before working on this review today, I see that now players will be drawing cards from the bottom of the deck when a special card comes up. But to be fair, those weren't in the rules when we played and for this preview. Uh, so it's, it's a real problem. And actually, it seemed to become worse uh, the more you could do is the more chances you were going to draw special cards that caused actions and left you short. So it will be interesting to see the new, uh, the new version. The new version, yeah. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is a combat system. We've already mentioned that this is going to be a flag for some people. This is going to be a divisive mechanic for many groups. The whole all or nothing, roll a huge pull of dice, and you either defeat something or you don't, is nice and quick. Rolling huge piles of dice feels good. But I think a lot of RPG fans, especially pen and paper role-playing game fans, are going to hate the fact there's no tracking of hit points. There's no slow progression of damage and defeating something. 
I also feel some people are not going to like how armor works because armor in the game is just a number that gets added to your health to make you harder to kill, unless some card says ignores armor. While I recognize these mechanics from video games, I don't know any other tabletop game that uses them. Yeah, and I think it makes much more sense in its solo farm than it does in the group cooperative play. As three of you in each turn, each doing 120 points of damage, but with the armor, it, the monster has 130, so even though all three of you are slaying away at it, it lives on happily. Yeah, I will say the, the rules as they stood for combining attacks were a little ob ob obtuse, they were a little hard to understand, and I didn't find a reason other than maybe it breaks the game for why you shouldn't be able to combine attacks from other characters. Like, maybe it just makes it too easy, but it, it rationally, it didn't make sense. So overall, as it stands right now, Hellbringer shows a lot of promise. The basic gameplay is engaging and fun. The mechanics work well together. And while we did hit a lot of stumbling blocks when trying to learn the game, those were all due to an incomplete and poorly translated set of rules. Both things that honestly shouldn't be a problem by the time any of you are able to pick this game up or back in on Kickstarter. We honestly found, all of us found, a lot to like in Hellbringer. And what I'm looking forward to is seeing how it improves and develops further. Because it's already good. How great can it be? For all the frustration and flaws, especially as that solo or two-player co-op game, I think it's got huge potential. If you're looking for an engaging solo dungeon crawl, you're going to want to keep your eyes open for Hellbringer. The game plays nice and quick solo, and I found that dying in solo just made me want to try again. It had that, oh, I was so close, I got to give it another try, which honestly to me is a perfect sweet spot for a cooperative game. Now, as for a cooperative dungeon crawler, Hellbringer's solid but not perfect. While the mechanics for trading cards and working together are pretty solid, there can be a lot of downtime, especially if a character ends up dying. And I really hope it's these aspects of the game that get a little play test a little more, a little more developed and improved to see this become a more smooth, solid, cooperative experience. Now, where I do think this game may find a market that you might not expect is fantasy role-playing game fans looking for some way to enjoy a dungeon crawling experience without needing other players. While I wouldn't say this is a solo GM-less RPG, you're not going that far, but you do really get that beat up the monsters, level up your character, and equip new equipment. Like To me, this seems like the perfect game for when you know, your D&D game gets canceled and you still kind of want that experience. And again, personally, the big thing I'm looking forward to is where is this going to go? I know the game's improving. I know it's changed since we played it, and every change I've seen looks better. It's already good, but has every opportunity to become great. So that's it for our preview of Hellbringer coming soon to Kickstarter. Now, if you're interested in a more detailed breakdown of how to play in the components in Hellbringer, you can check out my written preview over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So Sunday afternoon, we went over to Brenda's. Uh, the plan at the time was to finish off Star Wars Unlocked. We have one scenario left, but it ends up uh, Aunt Holly got a new Kirby game on the Switch, and the kids were much more interested in playing that. Kirby is a big draw, I will admit. I just kind of went like, come on, we're going to sit down with the whole family and play something together. We kind of want to play Kirby. He almost forced him. We talked about him. I'm like, just let him go. We'll, we'll figure something else. So the one cool thing that did happen is that Holly was able to join us for the first time in a long time. And the all adults sat down. That sounds weird. I, I, I boarded and the adults played a couple rounds like, oh, we played adult games. No, we all sat down and played a couple rounds of Yardmaster, which I don't remember the last time we talked about, but we it, it's been a while. Uh, Deanna's actually been itching to play Yardmaster. Uh, it's a light train game since we talked about it in our vacation games episode. And she's like, ah, oh. and it went well. Uh, Holly had never played before. Brenda had. Brenda has been asking. She's like, can we please play? Brenda is like, like mother, like daughter. Brenda's like, can we please play games more than once? <laughs> like, so I can actually learn a game and develop strategies instead of seeing them once. She's like, I understand that you need to review stuff, but now and then. So that was the other reason we brought Yardmaster. Um, one of the best parts about Yardmaster and why we enjoy it so much, why we do recommend it, is that it's thinky, but not too thinky. Uh, the mechanics are dead simple. Uh, dead draft cargo cars, use those to buy train cars or swap your trade token. That's your three options. But the strategy of deciding what colors and numbers to buy and when to take each action are surprisingly deep. 
it's one of those games where you have to try, but you don't have to try so hard that you can't be having a conversation or having other things go on at the same time. Yeah, no, and I, I, this is something that we should, you know, find a, uh, you know, find a place to find a bar that with a big enough table to uh, to, to play three player uh, at. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the problem with yard mats, the one complaint we did have is is it's it's standard player size cards, and you're you're adding up the numbers of the cards, and at least with the player count we're at, you need to add up to sixteen. And well, if you collect a lot of ones, that could be sixteen cards for your train and we were saying you know i i generally hate hobbit size cards but they work really well in um in space space and i'm like i want the space space the half cards that would work so much better for this game now in addition to this um i sat down and by myself and played some hellbringer uh, in prep for tonight's review now sean tried it on his own didn't go very well it was actually kind of amusing because it was uh he was in town and i was doing some work and then i came downstairs he was in the middle of playing and I'm like, oh, wait, wait, that's not how you do that. He's like, what do you mean? The rule book says this. And I'm like, well, I watched how to play video. That's how you're supposed to do it. Uh, but we already talked about that enough already. So what I do want to highlight is just my last game. This is part of, and, and honestly, this impacted the review tonight and, and made it more positive. So I played the scenario with the Black Dragon. I don't know what number it was. Um, with the Sorcerer. And it was super close match. So I started with the Tidal Wave card in my hand. Now, the Tidal Wave card is one of the best cards in the game, as far as I can tell. It's super expensive, costs like seven uh, actions to put into play, but it hits all the enemies, and it's based on how many skills you have, and I'm playing the Sorcerer, who had lots of skills. So I had that, and I spent all of my kills on getting enough actions to get it in play. So once I got that in play, I was kind of steamrolling stuff, but then I got the Blizzard card. Well, the Blizzard card was another AoE card that does additional damage based on how many skills you have. So they're both AoE, so they can combo and hit all enemies. It was ridiculous. So I actually got to the boss fight thanks to having this combo. And plus, I had spent all my stuff on getting these out, so I didn't have much health. But thankfully, my companions soaked much of the damage on the way there. And while there's a rule I think we might have played wrong, so when you get to the point where there's nothing in play, we were drawing five cards, then putting the monsters in play and having them go. That's actually wrong. The only thing you do is if there's no monsters in play, you draw five new cards. That is the monster turn. If there are monsters in play, then you roll the die and see if they attack. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something we did wrong, which made it way harder for us when we were playing three player. Yep. Uh, so doing that right made a difference. So I get to this dragon and it's like a stalemate. It can't do enough to hurt me. I can't see him. But he's doing enough damage to take out all my companions. So it's just companions die, companions die, companions die. My turn starts being rolling 15 or so dice, hoping for 135 damage, which is possible, but highly unlikely. His turns are getting within 5 to 10 of killing me, but never quite getting there. I got to admit, it had a neat mechanic. He rolled poison damage, and for every poison that hit, it rolled additional red dice, which was a neat mechanic. It was a black dragon, so acid, right? Thanks for sticking to the standard tropes of black dragons. Uh, eventually, I get eight skills in play, and my combo of blizzard and tidal wave gets up to 22 dice, plus three poison dice from another ability, and I managed to do 125 damage, which is just enough to kill the dragon as that new skill I put in play reduces enemy armor by 20, 10. But, like, it was epic and very rewarding. Like, the amount of back and forth. I, I can't believe how much it was like, okay, I did it. All right, I'm going to try. I don't have enough dice, but it's possible. No. And then I was literally going fish. Like, we're saying don't go deeper in the deck. Well, once you got to the demon, it's all just useful stuff. So I was literally like, I discard five cards. Why well, My hand limit was six. Of them. I discard six cards. I draw six new ones to find anything that would combo with what I have. The problem is all the monsters are done, so I can't level up or rearrange things. So I had to try to get a combo that worked better than the combo I had. And it, was, it was interesting. There's a, there's a companion, the angel, that lets you attack anything even if you can't see it. Of course, the turn I get that in play, the monster goes and kills my companions. So I would have died if my companion didn't die. So I guess the angel was good. So I, I really enjoyed that play. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, the, I, I did play a second. Like, so the first time I played solo went horribly bad. I did play it again a second time uh and had a, a similar experience to that it's definitely uh fun uh, uh more more fun uh with the second time once i knew the rules because we played it all together a couple of times hey we have a moderator you don't have to get distracted yeah sorry 
<laughs> so now at this point, my step with Hellbringer is to give it back to Max. I'm going to send it back to the designer up in Quebec, uh, who's going to swap out some cards and the instructions and send it off to another reviewer. So the next time you see me talking about this should be when the completed game is out after a hopefully successful crowdfunding effort. And we just gave Max a ton of tips for his crowdfunding, so he can blame us when it doesn't work. I am really looking forward to seeing where this goes. So for me, uh, the only real game I've played recently, Blood Bowl 3, just came back into beta. Uh, amusingly, this is one year almost to the day from the first time they went into a semi-public beta uh or a private private beta uh, and announced that they were going to be going into early release in september uh <laughs> uh and still haven't um so the game are has... they still supposed to be early release in september is no. that the latest well no this is they've changed that they've no, changed i, I just wonder if you times. knew what the latest no, release I, is for I, I i honestly haven't looked at what they're claiming this time because okay fair enough who knows uh but i have to say they have been making improvements the game is Good. better um, there are still some visibility issues of, of dice on the screen uh, that myself and others are complaining about. And I even caught a typo in mm. in something that I think was there. Like, like this isn't even new content, uh, mm. but there are typos in it. Have but, they balanced the knuffle thing a little better? Uh, I, you know what? I just explored. I just played uh, one full full game. I noticed um, they finally gave you more races to play. Yes, they're up to four races now. Uh, I just I just played one elf versus uh, human game today. Um, I the AI apparently isn't that much better because I'm not a great Blood Bowl player, and I won three nothing against human <laughs> uh, team. All right, so yeah, we'll see. All right, finally, I had a game night last night, which is like I don't know if that's ever happened. So we had a very rare Tuesday game night with Tori and Cat. Uh, you're welcome, Jamie Stegmaier. Uh, We finished off our Charterstone campaign. Now, I will fully admit, the reason I did that is so we can review Charterstone next Wednesday. So stick around for next Wednesday so we can review that. Um, it's done. We finished Charterstone. We finished game 12. I kicked everyone's butts. I, I kicked butt with endgame scoring. I had 26 points in endgame scoring, and no one expected that, that. And it looked like I was losing. So I, I totally de destroyed the last game. I got 90 some points. So nine, that was worth 90 points on the final game too. Like the final score. Um, I got to check off nine little boxes. Um, I really liked the limitation for the last game and wish it was involved in more games. I, I think is all I'll say again, I, I won't spoil anything about Charterstone. Um, the last game was fun. Uh, there was some neat stuff. I, I really liked the special rule. All of us were just all about the points like everyone was trying to upgrade their buildings to buildings that kind of sucked and no one wanted, but they were worth more points and people were trying to trade in the most things. And we had the closest grouping of scores for the entire game. Like it was like, you could see our, like they kind of went back and forth. It looked like a horse race with our score going around the track where often it's like one or two people kind of get in the lead. Deanna's kind of like, I don't care about points because I'm doing my own thing. So I don't worry about it. Whereas this was very much, uh, much more competitive than our previous games of charter stone. It is a competitive game. So we finished it. I was expecting more story at the end, and I will admit I was disappointed there wasn't a lot more fanfare. Um, we did then do the final scoring, and once the final scores came in, it was Cat for the win, with Deanna in second, myself in third, and Tori in last. What I find the most fascinating about that is Tori and I tied for overall wins during the campaign. We each had four. Cat had two indiana only had one i think that no cat had three cat had three indiana only had one deanna set up her strategy from the very beginning of the campaign to not worry about winning the individual games and to focus on a specific strategy which even mentioning that may spoil something and focus on that and we actually thought she won the campaign having only won one game and i'm not sure i feel about that deanna is all proud of herself but i'm just like that feels kind of broken to me like, but I had a, you know, singular vision. I'm going to do this. I'm focusing on this end goal thing that should get me a lot of points. So fair enough. Um, unfortunately, it was really close because uh, Kat decided to give us some heart attacks. So we thought Deanna had won by one point. And then when cleaning up, Kat found two more things in her box that weren't out on the table. And that ended up swaying it more her way. 
So that, that was a little, you know, I, that, that would have made a good live stream. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting one. Like whether or not you can play a game purely for the long game right and like, utterly like, ignore the individual games it's it's interesting um, yeah that's what i said I, I don't know how i feel I, it, it's like it was close too yeah. like 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 if deanna had just tried harder on one other game <laughs> and went for points instead yeah no that's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing and i, I mean i'd have to sort of think about whether or not the the designer had that in mind when they were right. building the game and for a bit, we thought you might have handed the game to Cat. Oh, jeez. We thought you might have taken the card that gave the most points for the thing, oh. but it wasn't. Oh. We actually had to find your package and open it. <laughs> like maybe that one game Sean played did swing it, but it didn't. It it wouldn't have, it would have changed the final outcome on that. Right. And no, I did not up your charter to see how many <laughs> points you had. I could have, but it, we didn't do that. Oh. Now the next thing that I, that we here you go. It, here's why publishers should use us as reviewers. What we're gonna do in the 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 concept of due diligence is we're not going to review it based on this because we are going to play a game of charterstone with our finished copy because like risk legacy when you finish charterstone you end up with a unique charterstone game that you continue to play from now until you're totally sick of it and i gotta say i bet you most people stop at the end of the campaign but i read through the new rules and they're interesting um, they they turned a lot of the stuff we unlocked into drafts. So you take all the the does it spoil anything? Okay, you take all the personas and you shuffle them and you get the and everyone gets some and picks one to use. You do the same thing with some of the other stuff. I'm pretty sure you start with a persona, so I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying there's personas. Um you randomly roll the charter stone to see what charter you play. And that's what drawing me in is I totally want to play Cat's Pumpkin People or Tori's Wheat Field thing that's going on or D's Coal Miners with Ghosts. I, I don't want to, like, I think we're going to house rule it that no matter what, no one plays their own charter. I want to play someone else's charter and see how it goes. Then what will be interesting is the buildings aren't worth points anymore. And there's still stuff we didn't build in crates we didn't unlock. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what we build over stuff that might have been worth a lot of points, but not all that useful and how much that'll change. Right. So we're going to do it. So, so here's the official announcement. We are going to play at least a third game of Charterstone to see how it works. So we can review a finished game of Charterstone as a game on its own. All right. Excellent. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, okay, so anyone following me on Twitter, the fine folks in our Discord, and now you hear folk here here live can see this massive box. I don't even know if I can lift my arm or so much. I can't even get it all on the camera. So we're <laughs> gonna do stuff with this, and I'm looking forward to doing this. Um, we got to open that up. Um, we're gonna do that in the after show. So stick around if you want to see what's in the box. Um, then I'm gonna have to start doing a uh unboxing time live and let die thank you for the raid You're, we're like five minutes from the end of the show but we will be doing an after show and we will be hanging out the chat um so getting back to looking ahead what's coming up so i'm gonna crack open the box then we're gonna have to do unboxing videos um i gotta unbox that but you don't know what it is yet i've got some other games for my pile of shame i want to do um one of them is going to be preda porter Preda Porte, or however you pronounce that, as well as some older games I've gotten shrink in the pile of shame. Um, I shared a selfie on our Discord channel earlier today. It's going to be games from that pile. Um, one of them is going to be the Aztecs expansion for Imperial Settlers. That should be a nice quick unboxing, so we got that. Uh, now, besides unboxings, I've got a two-player only Steffenfeld game here, Revolution 1828, that I am looking forward to playing because I was all worried. I've heard it's kind of like a Twilight Imperium or Twilight Struggle. But like the rules here are actually, that's it. The rest is history. It's dead simple. So this is here. We're going to check that out probably this weekend. I just found out while we were recording the show that Tori and Kat are coming over on Friday. Um, we were going to have them come over on a Tuesday as well. So that, that may not happen. I think we're just going to do the one. 
So that is definitely something we are going to do. Um, the Imperial Settlers is to go into that Let's Play Games more than once banner because these mum liked it. Um, so I do have that. We're going to try that. Maybe we'll do that. Um, and we may try one of the most popular two-player board games of all time to get it off the shame, off the pile of shame. Um, I've got the rule book in my car right now for the next time I have to sit in the car, which is tomorrow afternoon. While my daughter's at therapy, I will be reading the rules for something that was the number one game on Board Game Geek. And we'll get that played. And then we'll feel guilty for not playing Wingspan for PAX. Sorry, PAX. <laughs> hey, Roger, do you have Wingspan? That might be a way we can play it. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Danielle and Owen Thomas. I fear it's about time we thanked Owen as well. John P. Kelly of the soon-to-be defunct Gaming and BS podcast. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to have to be able to call him out anymore. <laughs> we'll just have to say thanks, Sean. Yeah. Andrew Dacey. Thank you, Andrew. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. And Diane Tuzano. Thanks always, Mom. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Show your support for us at Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bellhop and sign up for awesome bonus content, including hours of bonus audio and important to today's episode, bonus entries in today's giveaway. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you for the lobbyists for joining us, Raiders for hopping in. We yeah. invite you to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.